These pictures came from an archive at, uh, at the Niepce Museum. I did a show uh, last year, and I, the show was like this, but I also, I also wanted to use, they have such an extensive archive, like five million pictures. And I thought it would be kind of nice to, um, to somehow use that stuff. So these two, pic these, these two murders here were, are actual pictures taken in the 50s in Mexico about, um, I don't know, they look like gangster, I don't know what, what the story around them were. But I found them very intriguing. And I, I wanted to make a kind of link between the two. So what I did, um, I made little origami swans and digitally put them into the, into the scene. And then the third image is someone making the swan. So it's, it's called the third swan, implying that the third murder hasn't happened yet. But it's, so it's, it's just the idea that photography can be an ongoing, continuous, it's not a static. You could be the next person. Yeah. It's something you take with you. You, know. and you don't really know if the hand is male, female. It's, it has nails, but it's got hairy arms. There's a strange, androgynous kind of quality to the, to the hand. And again, it has a cigarette, which is about time, you know, passage of time. And this, this single light that's coming from, you know, coming from the picture. But it, yeah, it's a, I think this is a very different kind of approach than, than these other ones. I mean, in these other ones, there is no crime, nothing. It's, but again, when you start to think about it, it doesn't look good for that girl, you know. That's what fascinates me, is why do we think that? I mean, there are many, many reasons for that, culturally ingrained reasons. I think it's, you know, the, you know it's, it's about the brutalization of women, it's about how culture, it, it's a really complex set of, you know, situations that make you revert to those kind of stereotypes. You know. But it's true. Well, these started in the 80s. Um, and I was very um, unhappy uh, what was happening in the 80s. You know, we had Thatcher and Reagan, and there was a huge kind of um, inequality happening. I mean, Thatcher was destroying the unions in Britain. Um, Reagan was busting unions in the States. There was this, suddenly this excess of wealth and um, a huge, a growing kind of poor section that was happening in... in. So I, I'm not a, um, a photojournalist. So I thought, I wonder if I could actually make a construction that would reflect the way I was seeing things happening socially. So I began taking these um, designer objects, designer kitchenware, like the Michael Graves, which was designed for upwardly mobile yuppies, you know, people with lots of money to have modern kitchens. And also thinking about the whole postmodern condition. And it seemed to me that there was this kind of uh, disjunction taking place. So I, it, it seemed these highly reflective, you know, beautiful objects, I mean, non-functional, I mean, that's a useless teapot. I mean, it burns your hand. I mean, it has no use whatsoever. It just looks good, you know. And, you know, thinking about the nature of design, I mean, my understanding of, of you know, design was um, form follows function. So what happens if um, the form and the content don't match? Again, there's another kind of collision. So, you know, the haves and the have-nots. I mean, in that one, we have this bombing taking place. This was done in the mid-80s. And I find it very interesting because the design of the pot is like an old Islamic helmet. So this idea of having, which, you know, I mean, this was 15 years before Iraq and Desert Storm. 
but some, somehow it, time has caught up with it. It suddenly now um, makes sense. You know. and, and like this one, this is a relatively new one. Um, I took these Alessi, you know, I, I, I sort of began thinking about futurism and futurism's obsession with motion and metallic skins and you know, reflecting the future. So I thought it, the, this, this little biscuit container, um, when you see a reflection, almost works like a strip of film. So I thought in the, in the manner of, in, in, you know, insanity and, you know, because the futurists were a little fascistic, you know, that this insane party is taking place in there between this crazy guy with tattoos and a gun and his girlfriend is just drinking and taking drugs. I mean, it's just this madness that's uh, taking place. So it's a, again, it's a kind of techno schizophrenia, you know, between the object and the content, but uh, together. So it's, it's, I love collisions. It's why I may explode in your head, hopefully. You know. This doesn't have the same, this doesn't have the kind of logic that the other pictures have. Um, I was really interested in not thinking about any stories and instead sort of pick up on thematic motifs that sort of relate. Because I found that um, stories happen that I could never think up. You know, you kind of, it's like a kind of a uh, free in your kind of consciousness, stream of consciousness, just let it kind of go by taking, you know, simple circular motifs and circle goes into squares and they go into lines and they go into something else. And, um, and in the tables, I, I didn't want the pictures to be experienced on white clinical walls. Um, I think photographs are a lot like chameleons. You know, they absorb the kind of conditions of where you see them. So uh, meaning is, I mean, photographs are totally contextually based in terms of uh, information. So I think that the, these old tables and the different styles um, take you on another journey. Um, the history of the table, the stains, the cuts, the things that fall on them sort of weave themselves into these stories as well, which really, which really kind of interests me. And Actually, when I was when I was doing a, a version of this in at the Nieps, um, someone said to me that if I knew that that all narratives come from four sources, I thought, wow, that's you know. It, and he said that um, it's either your it's your relationship to death, your relationship to your parents, your relationship to God, and to love. And I thought, I don't know whether that's true at all, but it's an extraordinarily provocative thing to say. So it's sort of, I began thinking, I wonder if it's possible to do, to do a work that, in, that embraces the origin of all stories. I mean, it's an insanely ambitious project. But that's the kind, and I think with the tables, that sort of ties itself into that again. But, the, but it's, it's sort of a question of the nature of arbitrariness um, and how meaning, and you know, the, the, the title Loose Threads addresses, you know, this whole thing like an like a old carpet. You know, it opens up and it closes up. There are things that tighten up, that become more logical and, more, and other things are diffused. But they all have this sort of mathematical interrelationship. And of course, these are all going to disappear. So it, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it's not a static situa situation. It's 
changing all the time imperceptibly. Yeah. So it's really much like uh, they're like little membranes of memory yeah, that are slowly disappearing. I find that really fascinating. Yeah. It's like a kind of Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> the photographs are not permanent conditions. You know, if photographs are, were born of light, but light also is their enemy, yeah. that it, they destroyed it. Yeah. So it's just, again, it's another paradox.